Well, hello, I'm Larry Paul, the director of the American Institute of Pyramid Research, and I'm thankful to RC that they allow independent scholars like myself to be part of the proceedings. So I'm going to be presenting about markers on the east side of the Great Pyramid. Now, I want to welcome those of you who probably wouldn't have come to an Egyptological conference. You know, I paid a lot of money to come to this conference last year, and you guys did get to come for free. So it's uh, an unfortunate situation in our world that has allowed this, but that's one of the blessings that has come from this. So I hope uh, that you're taking advantage of this thing that R.C. might not do again. So last year I presented about the trial passages of the Great Pyramid. They're about 100 yards east of the Great Pyramid, as you can see there. And I advocated for their restoration. They've become quite uh, disheveled in the past decade. They've been locked for a decade. So I sought Dr. Huas's help, and he said, we're working on this project right now. That was in February 17th, 2019, he told me. And then last month, I talked with the Director General of the Giza Pyramids, Ashraf Mohi al -Din, and he told me that, yeah, the uh, in, in the fall... Uh, there's going to be a new administration in Giza. You know, there's going to be a new entranceway. They're going to close the two existing ones, the one near the Mina House and the one by the Sphinx. Uh, there's going to be the opening, hopefully, of the Grand Egyptian Museum. And so in that new Giza that's coming, Ashraf said, uh, they're, they plan to restore the trial passages. Now, let me say a quick word about uh, this picture I have of Ashraf with Melania Trump. That I, I know that date well because that was October 6, 2018, that Melania was finishing her tour of Africa uh, giving a talk at the Sphinx and going inside the Great Pyramid. There was only one other person that they allowed inside the Great Pyramid that day because it was closed for Melania, was me. I had my team in there uh, the morning of October 6th, uh, early in the morning, uh, very early, 3 to 5 a.m., and then they whisked us out and the Secret Service, you know, closed the plateau for Melania. So anyways, I mention you, Ashraf and Zahi, because I want you to get this done because this is the way these passages look now. Here I am standing. You can see all the sand that's filled up the entrance there. We're looking in at the garbage that's uh, collected at the entrance to the trial passages and at the exit, basically the Grand Gallery, where I'm sitting on one of the ledges that would be in the Grand Gallery, you can see that they're locked and they have been for over a decade. It's a shame. They were built by the builders who built the Great Pyramid. They're, they'd be a great tourist attraction and a great place for scholars to work. So in my proposal for this session, uh, you can see on the right here uh, about the markings on the east side of the Great Pyramid. I quoted Dr. Lehner in a paper he wrote about uh, Head of Fairy's tomb. He said, how could features of the Great Pyramid's passages enclosed in masonry high up inside the superstructure be aligned to features cut into the bedrock? And he, there's kind of a wonderment in his question here. And uh, that's basically what you know, my session's about. How could this be? You know, how could marks down here on the bedrock point to passages up here? Well, the Egyptians did an incredible thing, I think, and uh, you'll see more as we go on here. I did mention I'd talk a little bit uh, in my, my proposal about the discipline of Egyptology, and part of what I had in mind for that is from within, in, within the discipline, John Romer, who's an Egyptologist, wrote a book about the Great Pyramid. And uh, this is the, uh, the, the challenge he gives to the profession. He says here, my first task when I set out to write this book was to discover why no one else had done this work before me. Why the archaeological study of ancient Egypt's most celebrated monument, and most especially its interior, had been neglected for so long. How such a failure of scholarship and imagination had occurred and why, as a scholar reviewer recently observed, quote, modern Egyptologists have largely given up on the pyramids. Well, shame on you, John Romer would say, but John, if you would have been at Arce last year, I heard this expression bantered around by Egyptologists and archaeologists, return to Giza. So maybe, John, what you uh, slammed the profession for might be something that's going to happen. I hope it does, a return to Giza. Well, let's start uh, looking at these markers on the east side. We'll start with the trial passages. Uh, the trial passages are... Uh, here's a, a top view of the Great Pyramid. You can see where the passage line is there. It's offset from the north, the east-west uh, uh, center line there. So if you take that center line and put it over the center line of the three satellite pyramids, the place where the passages in the Great Pyramid are line up exactly with where the trial passages are. And just to see this in a diagram, in black is the Great Pyramid, the perimeter is in black, and then if you moved it down so it was placed over the trial passages, the trial passages would line up with the passages that are in the Great Pyramid. It's really incredible. The, the only difference is the trial passage are, are, even though they simulate the passages, they're shorter, but they're the same size. So the trial passages in the relationship they bear to the interior structure we just saw seem to act like they're a, a key, like to a map. 
So, you know, the Great Pyramid is a much debated land. You know how many different things are said about it. And so it would be nice to have a key. The trial passages, I think, act as one of the keys to the Great Pyramid, just as any map has a key. Okay, the second set of markers, uh, the third trial passage. This trench here is called the third trial passage. The entrance to the trial passages is there. The well shaft that goes down to where the uh, passages uh, intersect is there. And then the exit, basically the Grand Gallery, is there. Well, this trench is called the third trial passage. And it's 100 yards away from the Great Pyramid. So as we saw, if you move the center line of the Great Pyramid uh, over to the axis uh, of the uh, uh, trial passages, you'd have that situation. And so there is the axis of the trial passages. And there is the axis of the trench. And that trench points directly to the satellite pyramid top, the tops of the satellite pyramids, their north-south axis. So you can see it's pointing right toward Head of Fairies there, and it goes right over the top of the other two satellite pyramids too. Interesting. The third set of uh, markings on the east side of the pyramid I want to look at are four holes that go across the trial passages. So the trial passages are uh, right down there. So there's one of the holes, there's another hole, there's the third one, and there's a fourth one. So obviously uh, they set a direct line to the grotto right there. So I just think that's interesting because uh, there's where the holes are. So you can see where they are in relationship to the Great Pyramid, and that's what they look like. As a matter of fact, that shape of hole, uh, Dr. Lehner and Dr. Romer have said, uh, exist all around the pyramid, and they were used in, in Khafre and Khufu to help line them up, keep them straight. Uh, actually, Dr. Romer says there's a life-size blueprint here on the east side of the Great Pyramid, a one-to-one -one blueprint that they used to keep the pyramid from becoming a corkscrew. But usually when you see the grotto pictured, uh, you know, if at all, like sometimes some elevation views of the Great Pyramid don't show the grotto like it's shown here because it's treated like a, like a service shaft, as it's called by some Egyptologists. But I think the fact that, that the, uh, the original builders lined up those holes to point to it say, don't neglect this. I think there's something more uh, that we need to know about the grotto, even though it looks like an industrial development. There's, again, the extension of those four holes that goes right to the grotto. I think that probably symbolically there's meaning there, if nothing else. Okay, the, the uh, f fourth set of markers that I probably did the most amount of study with when I was in Giza in uh, February and March are five markers that are a little bit closer to the Great Pyramid than the trial passages. Uh, you can see right there is about where they are. So there's a picture of them, okay? So when I first saw these, they shouted out to me, now these are big gouges. It's almost like, hey, pay attention, pay attention, focus your eyes this way. Because this line right here seems to point directly to the inside of the pyramid, like right directly to the very center of it. So uh, we'll see what I can do to figure out more about that. But this is in so, of course, what I could do when I saw, I thought they pointed to inside the Great Pyramid is do research on it. You know, maybe there is some significant to these holes. So I numbered them. You can see that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And uh, I made booklets to give to my guys that were going to be on my research team. And so that's uh, Will Wire, who's a builder and a designer from uh, Boulder, Colorado. And in the foreground, now measuring the marks, is uh, Orion, who's a uh, gifted photographer and artist. And he came along to, uh, to take videos of our, our uh, expedition there. So the main data I wanted to obtain was the angle at which each of these holes was pointing. Okay, so, you know, you can see that they're not uh, the most precise, you know, optician's uh, clarity of, of marks, you know. And you can see that these point, and they're fairly specific. They're not pointing that way, the way the red is. It's, that one's pointing where the blue is. Okay, and this one you can see is pointing that way. It's not pointing that way. Even though these are somewhat gross markers, apparently they point in a relatively specific direction. Okay, so that was the work that I had cut out for me, and so we went to work and did that. So, you know, we took uh, various readings, and then, you know, I gathered all the data together, had to shift it and shake it like, shake it like you always do, to, you know, evaluate it and uh, see where things stood. So I made a point to not talk with my guys at Giza 
uh, hardly at all about measuring these marks because I didn't want them to be influenced by the measurements I had taken. I truly wanted, you know, independent things. So I have communicated with them somewhat, uh, you know, online since we've come back from Giza. But that, that was the principle I chose. So the results. Now the results are striking. Now I know as a researcher you are not supposed to say things are striking, but the results are striking, and, and I think you'll agree once you see this. Okay, so there's the top view of the Great Pyramid. We're used to looking at the elevation view where you see the chambers, you know, going up and, and the descending passage going down. So this is the top. So I had an artist friend of mine uh, write the names of the passages there, the King's Chamber, Queen's Chamber, and so on. So you can see where they are. So at a glance, uh, here's where those pointers that were different colors pointed. So basically, they all pointed to major parts of the internal structure of the Great Pyramid. I thought, that's incredible. I mean, that was what my instinct was, but the, this data, you know, bears that out. So in a word, you know, we hit pay dirt. I think this is a real finding. Now, we hit pay dirt because there were no lines like that that went out to left field, that touched nothing, that were just, you know, totally anomalous. And there wasn't any I really had to, had to throw out for that reason. So I think that's pretty incredible. So I think uh, that these, these uh, markings, unlike the markings that are just meant to keep the pyramid in line and that the builders could use as, a, you know, the way a mason uses a, a string line to, to keep a course straight, a lot of the markings on the pyramid bedrock are for that. But I think these markings create like a commentary. There's more of a message here. There's a, there's a, it's like un, unlocking hieroglyphics. There's a message here that needs to be unpacked. And it could be a guide, and here's why I say that. Uh, pictured in, in that uh, iPhone, you can see uh, the scan chamber that, that the, uh, from the muon scans that the Scan Pyramids team did. Now, this is being held by uh, Dr. El Damadi, who was the Minister of Antiquities in Egypt from 2014 to 2016, and he's the one who commissioned the Scan uh, Pyramid study, the muon study. He's the one that brought it in. And when he, I was visiting with him in his uh, office at Anshines University, and when he couldn't find on his computer the picture he wanted, he pulled his phone out and I said, hey, can I take a picture of that? And so I did that because where the, uh, the scan void appears on his picture, uh, the guy who commissioned the study seems to be a little bit different than it's pictured in a lot of places on the Internet. So if you look at the gold arrow that I put here, that I, one of my pointers pointed right to a spot that didn't seem to be directly one of the chambers. And I thought, oh, man, that might be this might be a way to, uh, you know, actually ha have a pointer to where something about that that's that chamber that everyone says is there now as a matter of fact i know for a fact the egyptian government just had kind of quietly they had the scan pyramids team come back in to try and figure out the mo the least intrusive way to try and get at and study that that new chamber that the that the muons say is there interesting okay but then when i was presenting uh, pre preparing this stuff to present uh, at rc i saw a whole other thing i hadn't seen when i was at giza so i'm calling this phase 2 of our part four study here. So basically, uh, I knew that uh, these things, I thought they were just all pointing that way to the Great Pyramid. But then I realized as I look closer, hey, there are other pointings going on here. So once I plug that in, that led to some amazing results. So here's the, again, the, the phase one results, but let me just share with you a couple of the phase two results here. So this is uh, the markers from, um, pointers from mark number one. So the two arrows that go into the the chambers there, one of them points directly to the middle of the Great Pyramid, to the exact center, and the other one points uh, to the Queen's Chamber. And uh, that was because there was a little bit of a difference in our measurements, so I just put those both there. But the other one is the, the Phase 2 mark. It goes right to the corner of the Great Pyramid. I felt like that was some kind of affirmation when it first happened, but it kept happening. When I took the uh, marker number 2, okay, that goes to the end of the Dead End Passage, the farthest you know, south you can go in the Great Pyramid, as far as we know, in terms of the, the passageway there. It's that, that narrow, dead-end passage at the bottom of the subterranean chamber. Interesting that it points there. And then the other pointer, the new one that I found from Phase 2, points exactly to that corner. And then it happens again. Here's the three pointers from Mark 4. Now, one of them points to the very end, the extremity of the King's Chamber, but there's one that goes off to the corner again, as if to say you're on the right track. You know, there's some kind of language here. There's something going on. And that's the one that I think might go to the scan pyramids there, the, uh, uh, the other uh, mark, the mark that was in there, because there was actually three pointers from mark number four. So I think uh, that's, that, that's just, I just scratched the surface there, and I plan to keep studying that, and I will publish about that. Okay, um, fifth set of markers. 
on the east side of the Giza Plateau. I should say that uh, the middle of the picture you see there is where the uh, south air shaft from the King's Chamber exits the Great Pyramid. Can you see it there? Okay, so there's a top view of the Great Pyramid. So I'm checking these markers. So I took the boat pits and oh man, it landed right on a corner there. I thought that's interesting. Wow, look at that. So I got Bob Criley, who's an engineer that works with the AIP, and he showed me that it was exactly the same distance from the top of the Great Pyramid as the notch. And the notch is a key you know, feature of the pyramid. It seems like it might have been part of the original construction to be like an observation post or something. And so basically a template was formed by that. You've got, you know, uh, the, the notch. Now we're the north is to the right here. And then here's the, uh, the corner that I found through the boat pointers there. And then this is the spot where, you know, the, the uh, air shaft exits the king's chamber in, in the south there. So I thought that's incredible. This, there is a template here. So uh, Bob realized, my engineer friend, that this template was the same size as the base of the Menkara Pyramid and one-fourth that of Khafre. Oh my goodness. So we were just getting so excited about this. We were in constant communication, testing, aligning, seeking better maps, you know, because you need a straight-on satellite view to, to avoid distortion and stuff. So just a couple preliminary findings here. So I went to uh, last month to the, the tomb of Hemiunu, the architect of the Great Pyramid, G4000. And, and the main reason I went there is because Manu uh, Sevzada uh, published this academic article, Hemiunu used numerically tagged surface ratios to mark ceilings inside the Great Pyramid. He shows that uh, Hemiunu built his tomb different than those other tombs in the West Field there. It's the second largest tomb in the West Field. And he shows that Hemiunu made architectural indications about the Great Pyramid, and they might even help us find the hidden spaces there. So this, you know, this, I thought, you know, this architect, Hemiuna, what a sharp guy. So I thought maybe he, if that template I found is really there, let's check it out and look at this. If you take the template that you see over the top of the Great Pyramid, I simply took the, the top line on the north side there and extended it west, and then the center of the Great Pyramid right through the top and I took that west, and look at that, that rectangle there. That's the tomb of Hemiunu. It seems to me that this template we found is one that the architect meant to be there. Incredible. And so, uh, you know, here's a, just a quick sketch I did today. I just made a checkerboard from it, and you can see that uh, it goes just following the checkerboard from that template. It goes right over the top of Khafre, and it's one half. It's like Menkara's right in the exact center in between two of the checkerboard squares there. And then you can see where Hemiunu's tomb is uh, up top there. So to me, uh, this template is a key to the Giza Plateau. And, and I'll even say my friend Bob Criley, my, my engineer that works with the, the American Institute of Pyramid Research, has extended it out to Alexandria and Port Said, Israel and other places and shows that this template, if you extend it like a thousand times, it's still there. Somehow the Egyptians might have used this to actually measure not just Giza, but the world. That's, a, that's an outlandish claim, I know, but we'll, we'll be publishing more about that. Okay, well, I hope I've whetted your appetite for things about these uh, fantastic markers where we're going to continue our research this on this and many other things. So uh, let's return to Giza. You know, there's a lot to learn here. Okay, looking forward to questions. And feel free to contact with me because this is going to be just a, such a short time we have that, uh, you know, if there are questions, they can be answered through email and phone calls and everything else. So, again, thanks for coming.